Well, first of all, let me introduce my wife, uh, my co laborer in the Lord. Praise the Lord. So good to be back with you, and want to thank uh, Pastor Marty and the church leadership for inviting us back, and also my family is taking up this whole row here. Praise the Lord, my sister and her husband, and nieces and nephews. And uh, so, yes, we are working uh, in Botswana, Africa, mostly. Uh, recently, a door has opened so that we can begin to help also in Uganda with some Bible training. Uh, but most of our work is, is in the country, uh, the nation of Botswana. Uh, we have been doing church planting uh, we'll be going back and doing a lot more evangelism now that the COVID thing has lifted. Uh, that was pretty strict there in Africa for us. And so we thank God that we're going to have a lot of opportunities now. We've been working with the schools, uh, working, uh, preaching at assemblies and schools. The school that we work with came in number one in the region academically. Praise God. The children received Christ and uh, they did very well on their exams. Praise the Lord. The Daniel story is true, you know, that God can make us brighter and smarter. And, uh, and so we thank God for what he's doing. So there's, there's a lot of doors of opportunity for us, and uh, we certainly do covet your prayers. Uh, there are some brochures in the back if you want to get involved with us individually, personally. We certainly would appreciate that. We do do Bible training uh, in Botswana. We're asking for your prayers uh, specifically with that one. We want to register uh, with the government to get um, certified so, because the government is actually trying to encourage its ministers. We have so many churches where people are not actually trained in ministry, and they'll mix ancestral worship, uh, sometimes, you know, different forms of beliefs in those things, and uh, very detrimental in many ways. So, the government actually is trying to systematically get their people trained, but we need to be accredited. So, uh, we actually need some funds to make that happen. That's really one of the big dilemmas, is actually the finances to do that. So, if you'd be praying with us, we certainly would appreciate that. Um, and um, we've done a lot of work with killed children. We, we built an orphan center. We're asking the Lord to provide the parents now to care for the orphans. They have to be local. We've got a few houses that are ready to go. They've been approved. The, the, the dilemma is actually finding the parents because HIV hit Botswana in a, in a terrible way years ago. And so there are actually not that many people in their 40s and 50s. And so we're trying to find those that have already kind of raised children and, and now can take in uh, others. And also we have a farm that's uh, it's 109 acres. It's about to be 115 acres. Uh, and we, we have some groups in the States that want to help us with aquaponics. And also we've got some goats and we're getting some cows and we've got donkeys and all those kinds of things so that we can be more self-sufficient on the ground in Africa and also train others uh, to alleviate poverty. So there's a lot of things going on and a lot of things for, for us to ask you to pray about. Praise the Lord. So let's pray and see where the Lord takes us together in these next uh, time. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you that you're here with us, Lord, and that you have a divine plan. And Father, we thank you that you are we're part of that and that you have things that you want to say to us this morning and that you want to encourage our hearts and challenge us. And so, Lord, we ask for grace to hear and grace to communicate. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Well, let's turn in our Bibles to the book of Exodus. And... Um, I've tried to get away from this uh, passage of Scripture for, for a while, but I keep coming back to it, so let's not fight the Lord. Exodus chapter 25, uh, of verse 40. And I just want to give you the background of what's going on here. Uh, Moses has gone up into the mountain to meet with God, and he has left his leaders uh, about, you know, halfway up the mountain somehow, and the children of Israel are in the, in the valley, and Moses has gone on to meet with the Lord, and the Lord speaks to Moses about building his house. And much of the scriptures is about either building the house of God, or rebuilding the house of God, or purifying the house of God. And so here, God is speaking to Moses on the mountaintop, and he's telling him about building the tabernacle, and building the furniture, and how to build the, or how to make the different garments that the priests are wearing. And God says to him, and see to it that you make them according to the pattern which was shown you on the mountain. 
And so God has a pattern in which he wants his house to be built like. He has a way in which he wants things done. He wants us to wear certain garments in our lives. And I'm not talking about, you know, suits or jackets and so forth. There, there's a way in which God wants things done. And so he told Moses, Moses, make sure you make it according to the pattern which is shown you on the mountain. Because by the time that Moses has done this conversation with God, the children of Israel are already going to be falling away from God in the valley. They're already going to be worshiping the golden calf. And some of his leaders are going to be participating in actually setting this up. And God told Moses, Moses, make sure you don't alter the plan. Make sure you make it according to the pattern which you see on the mountain, not what you see in the valley. Not based on your own frailties or the frailties of others. Build it according to the pattern which you see on the mountain. Hallelujah. And as God is still desiring to build his house, he wants us to build his house according to the pattern which he wants to show us. He doesn't want us to adjust it. He wants it to be like he wants. So I'm going to ask you if you would to turn in your Bibles to the book of Matthew chapter 28. And some of us are probably familiar with these verses. Uh, but I'm going to start up a little bit earlier in Matthew 28 verse 16. It says, Then the eleven disciples went into Galilee to the mountain which Jesus had appointed for them. When they saw him, they worshipped him. Some doubted. And Jesus came and said, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe the things that I've commanded you, and lo, I'm with you always, even until the end of the age. And I believe that this is the corresponding scripture for us, is that God took these apostles to an appointed mountain, and Jesus met for, with them and told them, I want the church to be built like this. Go and make disciples of all nations. Hallelujah. And to make it according to that pattern, to not adjust the pattern based in the times in which we live or based in, on the cultures in which we are to invade, but to go and make disciples, to make people that are like Jesus in power and in character. He wants Jesus like people. Hallelujah. To go and make disciples of all nations. Now, this was a monumental task because ultimately the Jews had held themselves back from other people groups. They kind of looked down at other people groups and the world was filled with, uh, you know, heathen cultures who were worshiping other gods, filled with immorality, had been entrenched for hundreds of years. And God was saying, don't build it any other way. Go and make these people disciples. Hallelujah. Their character can change. They can be different. They can be Jesus-like. Hallelujah. And so we find that there's a pattern that God wants us to build in our lives is not to have churchgoers, but to make disciples. Not simply to get people born again. We need to get people born again. But that's not the goal ultimately is we want to make disciples, not just people that are born again. And so the doorway is to open for us to be know what God is after in our own lives and in the lives of others. Let me say it this way. God wants you to be a disciple. He wants me to be a disciple. He wants you to make disciples. He wants me to make disciples. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Disciples making disciples, not pastors making disciples. Teach them to observe all that I've commanded you. What has he commanded us? To go and make disciples. To go and make other people like Jesus, even though they may not look anything like Jesus at the moment. Hallelujah. That they can change and that they can be different. Praise the Lord. Now, the scripture refers to us as being the body of Christ. 
And, you know, someone jokingly said, Christ is not Jesus' last name. <laughs> it means the anointed one. And, and Jesus kind of refer, told us or enlightened us what that anointing did in his life and what it was meant to do. And so we are to be the body, the, the, the expression of the anointed one. Which means that there should be supernatural events occurring in our lives. Because we are to be a supernatural people. Not simply a religious organization. Not a place where we just fit in and feel family. Yes, we want to feel family, but we're called to be more than that. We're to be an expression of Jesus himself in the earth. Hallelujah. And the world desperately needs to meet our Jesus. Jesus in his fullness. And so we need to meet the anointed one. We need to be an expression of the anointed one. So one day as I was praying, I, I had this thought, you know, about the body of Christ. And, oh, praise the Lord. Sorry, I haven't been seeing you up there. Praise the Lord. <laughs> I'm sorry. So the body of Christ. And, and, and so I got filled with the divine curiosity about the body. And uh, I started looking some things up on the Internet. And, you know, the Internet can be good for some things and very bad for others. Uh, and, and a lot of us, we need to spend less time on the Internet. Uh, because we're looking at the wrong things, and, I'm, and, and, and we've got our eyes on the wrong things. We're hearing too much of the wrong things. It's too negative. But as I begin to study the body, what I recognized is that God has designed the body. There's something like 30 trillion cells in your body right now, if you're full grown. That's a lot of cells. And God has designed them to replicate themselves. In other words, liver cells make liver cells. And so cells produce after their own kind. And so they kind of make others like themselves. And ultimately, that's what they're designed to do. And I found that fascinating. But the other thing that I found even more fascinating was that in each cell... Each cell had something called DNA, which was basically the master blueprint of the whole body. In other words, in my cells, in my, in my liver, in my kidneys, whatever, there's not just the design for making another kidney cell. There's also the design of the whole thing. In other words, each cell somehow understands that it's part of a bigger picture, which is bigger than itself. And that it has an individual purpose inside of itself, but the big picture is the overwhelming thing. And I've realized that throughout my life, inside of the body of Christ, sometimes I lost sight of the bigger picture. I just focused on my individual cell and events that were happening in my life and maybe the disappointments I had or someone doing the wrong thing or saying the wrong thing to me and, and lost sight of my part in the bigger overall expression of the body of Christ. So what I learned, you know, as I was reading that, I learned about you know, different viruses and one that was particularly interesting to me was the HIV virus, and I, I don't know if all viruses are like this, I don't think they are, but in some ways, some of them are. And what happens with HIV is that the virus lands on something on the cell called a receptor. And, and so what's supposed to happen is that your T cells are supposed to be able to identify this as a, as a invader, something that is dangerous, and to destroy it. But with HIV and with, with different things, it, it lands on that receptor, and instead of being removed, it stays there. And what happens is, the virus is not content to stay on the outside of the cell. It finds its way inside of the cell. And so what happens in each cell is this factory to produce other cells. But what happens is this renegade gets inside of the cell and begins now not to produce liver cells or different cells. It begins now to produce cells that are distorted. 
destructive. And I thought about my journey in the body of Christ now for over 40 years. I got saved when I was a young person. How there have been times in my life where certain things have landed on my life and instead of getting rid of them, I received them. They stayed on the receptor of my life. Instead of letting Jesus take that away from me, sometimes they actually got inside of me. And took over the factory of my life so that I wasn't producing healthy cells anymore. It was distorted. And I thought how it's possible to do that even in church life. That we can get certain things in our lives. And then when people talk about the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, we lose sight of the big picture. And we just, we just reproduce after our own broken or hurt or bitter kind. And then we wonder why a lot of people have not come back. Some of it is because their own issues, but some of it is because of our issues. You know, sheep, sheep don't like troubled waters, right? They like peace and calm. And so there are times in our lives when we have to identify and say, you know, this should not be in the factory of my life. This should not be the core of my being. This I should have got rid of when it first tried to attach itself to me. I should have said, no, you don't belong here because why? I'm called to a higher purpose to do something much greater than this. I'm called to be part of the body of the anointed one. And his body is a loving body. And his body is a forgiving body. And his body is a believing body. And his body is able to look at people that are broken and have made mistakes and believe the best in them. And how tragic it has been that at times and seasons of my life, I can look back and say the factory of my life was not what it should be. But thank God, God is faithful. Hallelujah. That he can send someone to talk to us and to speak to us and to help us. Or to read a scripture. Or sing a song that touches us and we realize this should not be the basis of my life. I think for many of us that are married, we know that at times we have let something into the factory of our marriage that shouldn't be there. And our relationships with our children, our relationships with our parents, our relationships with our pastor, or relationships with our congregation. But we're called to go and make disciples. And Jesus wasn't bitter. Hallelujah. He loved. I want to ask you if you would to turn with me to the book of Jeremiah. Jeremiah chapter 1. Jeremiah chapter 1 verse 4. Just for a background, for those that may not know, Jeremiah was from the priestly line. There were certain expectations for him to be a priest. And that was a wonderful thing. But God came to him in verse 4 and said, The word of the Lord came to me saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And before you were born, I sanctified you and ordained you a prophet to the nations. So here God is coming to Jeremiah and says, Jeremiah, before the cells started growing... I knew you. Before you were formed together, I had a plan for your life. Maybe no one else has recognized it. Maybe you're blind to it yourself. But I knew when I designed you exactly what you were called to do. Before anyone made a mistake in your life. Before you were the victim of abuse or low expectations, before you made your own series of mistakes, I knew you and I had a plan for your life. 
Because some of us, we have disqualified ourselves from the thing that God has called us to because of our own events. And God was trying to tell Jeremiah, your life is not the product of your own events. It's the product of my own hand and my own sight. And he was calling Jeremiah to attach to his purpose and his plan for his life. And then Jeremiah did something that often we do. Jeremiah said, ah, Lord God, behold... I cannot speak, for I am just a youth. Isn't it interesting? God says, you know, I had my eye on you before you were even formed in the womb. And Jeremiah says to God, look, like God's blind. Look at the designer of DNA. Look at the designer of the universe. The one who causes the stars to stay in their place and the galaxies to hold together. Jeremiah says to him, God, you don't see clearly. God, you're ignorant of who I am. He says, behold, look at me. I can't speak. Look at my limitations. I'm just a youth. I don't know about you, but I've done this to God at times in my life. Where God says, you know, I want you to do this. And I say, are you blind? I wouldn't say it in those words, but basically that's what I'm saying. You know, Moses did the same thing with God, right? God said, I'm going to send you and you're going to do this. And Moses says, "Mm, got the wrong guy. I'm old. And you haven't spoken to me until now, and now I'm 80. You know, nowadays in the church, we don't have people saying, the problem is I'm a youth. Now we have a problem with people saying, I'm too old. Behold, look at me, I'm old. What is the master designer saying? So God said, who made the blind and the seeing and the deaf and the dumb? Was it not I? I can see, I can hear, I know what you are. And I'm big enough to use you because I've designed you for use. Behold, I can't speak for I'm a youth. But the Lord said to me, don't say I am a youth. For you shall go to whom I send you, and whatever I command you, you shall speak. Do not be afraid of their faces, for I'm with you to deliver you. You know, there's some things in our lives that God wants to say to us. Don't say that. There are things in my life where I've said about myself or about my situation, and God wants to say to me, you know what, you said that enough. Don't say that anymore. Why? Because saying it is keeping us from the plan of God for our lives. I know what ministry failure looks like. I have had it. But that shouldn't define who I am. Any more than my successes should define who I am. I should let God define who I am. So don't say that. And then he says to Jeremiah, behold, I have put my words in your mouth. He said, I touched your mouth. Put forth my hand and touched my mouth. And the Lord said to me, look, I have put my words in your mouth. See, I have set you this day over kingdoms and nations to root out, to pull down, to destroy, to throw down, to build, and to plant. So now he's saying to Jeremiah, no, you look. Look at what I've done. I've touched your mouth. See, I've given you authority. There's a lot of us that we know the Lord touched our mouths. We speak in tongues. Strange, isn't it? 
For some of us that don't speak in tongues, we know that the Lord has still touched our mouths many times in many ways. And he says, see, I want you to look at the fact that I really did touch your mouth. So take the limits off. Take the limits off of what you think you can do. Because it's not about your mouth, it's about the fact that I have touched it that makes it significant. You know, in the Old Testament, we have a type in shadow where Samson takes the jawbone of a donkey and slays a thousand men. Well, if God can take the jawbone of a donkey and touch it with the spirit, then certainly he can use these jaws as well. So he says, now, Jeremiah, see this. And then he says something very interesting, and I, I love this part. Then the word of the Lord came to him saying, Jeremiah, what do you see? And this is really where the rubber meets the road in our lives many times. Jeremiah says, look at this, look at me. God says, look at this, look at this. And then God steps back and says, now, Jeremiah, what do you see? And Jeremiah's answer calls forth a response that God says, Jeremiah, you have seen well. I am now watching over my word to perform it. Which implies that it was possible for Jeremiah to see poorly. Right? So what did Jeremiah see that God was able to say to Jeremiah? Now, Jeremiah, you have seen well. What do you see? Because it doesn't matter what God sees. It doesn't matter what God says. It doesn't matter what God has done if we don't see it. So he says, Jeremiah, what do you see? And Jeremiah says, I see the branch of an almond tree. It's kind of a strange response, isn't it? But if you know the history of a branch of an almond tree in the scriptures. In the Old Testament, God chose Aaron to be the high priest. And man, Aaron had his faults. I mean, he's not normally listed as the heroes of faith, Aaron. A lot of sermons that Aaron gets are not good ones. And so the children of Israel, they naturally re rejected Aaron's leadership at many times. They were very familiar with Aaron's failures. And so they would fight against what he said many times. And so God said, I want to settle this once and for all. Take your rod, which was just a stripped down stick. And take the rods of the other leaders of the nations and bring them into the tabernacle.